Amen and amen. It's good to see you this morning. Praise the Lord. Tell you what, this uh, the Houston crud has took a swath through here. <laughs> Keep praying it away. Amen. Uh, how many of you have been blessed not to have any of that mess so far? Hey, amen. The few and the mighty. <laughs> Continue to pray. Don't get proud. Amen. Listen, uh, we start this new year. This is our first Sunday of this new year. Excited what we have to look forward to and to believe God for. Uh, in a couple of weeks, I'll be coming back and just sharing with you some things that uh, are on the horizon for the next, next year. New campus facilities are coming along. Uh, we turned over one of the buildings at the old campus to TextDot, who has that through eminent domain. And we're in one single facility out there now. And uh, the new building is going up. The pavilion has been built. It'll seat around three or 400 people in our pavilion that we put out there for activities and fellowships and special events and things like that. We put that up first because we knew it would go up real fast and the building would be much slower, just in case uh, eminent domain runs us out of our facility. But uh, new building has gone up. Framing's gone up on the exterior. The walls, the exterior walls are up. Uh, some of the doors are in, and now the roof goes on this week. So pray for good weather for us out there as that process continues to go on. And there's so many other things in ministry that we're looking forward to do this year. So uh, hold on. It's going to be a great ride. Amen. Uh, I, am, I don't know about you, I have a real uh, uh, anticipation, not an anxiety, <laughs> about this coming year. I believe the Lord has some great things in store for Believers Fellowship, uh, celebrating, what, 30 years in ministry as a church? That's a praise the Lord right there. This year we'll be celebrating 30 years. Some thought we wouldn't last three days, so I guess that's pretty good. Amen. <laughs> What a blessing it's been and what a ride it's been and what a blessing that uh, we've enjoyed together in the kingdom of God and in serving the Lord. Some of you have been here for the long haul. Some of you are new on this journey with us. But uh, I believe that the Lord has some great things in 2018, not only for our church, but for our lives. In fact, I want to talk about that today as we talk about a time for new beginnings. This is uh, a passage of scripture from Genesis 8 that we'll be looking at this morning. And it's, it's, it's at the end where... Noah and his family are just about to get off of the ark, and this passage is found there in that passage as they're looking out, and it says, on the first day of the month were the tops of the mountains seen, Genesis 8, 5. Uh, it's interesting. I, I'm not sure, but I know Brother Tim dealt with Genesis not too long ago on his Wednesday night series, but I am guessing that about, 100, about a year has gone by, not 100 years, a year has gone by just from a, a brief look at the overall of Scripture. Of course, 40 days of rain, but you have to realize that not only to rain for 40 days, we know what three or four days of rain is like, right? Uh, with Harvey here recently in our area, but can, and we saw feet of water in homes eight, 10 feet and high. Uh, but can you imagine 40 days of, of rain? Add to that, the Bible says that the deep, literally all the underground lakes, rivers, and fountains gave up. They blew up and exploded in, in, into the, onto the firmament where there was all this water gushing up from the earth. The Bible says that the above, and I believe that's that, that firmament up there where all this vapor collects around the earth, all that was released along with the lower atmosphere rain. So uh, there's water. We're talking about it when in, in Noah's situation, the ark at this point has come to rest on Mount Ararat, all right? So it's kind of found a resting place, and now some time has gone by where he begins to see as he looks out, and it says, and lo, the tops of the mountains are now being sound. So apparently the Lord has brought the ark to park on that high place of that mountain range, Armenia, Turkish area, and now as a little time goes by, he's beginning to see the mountaintop. So it takes a long time for these this type of floodwaters to recede. Long time on that little box called the ark. I mean, it's a pretty large box, but anyway, it's, it's, there's a long time there. But when it says this, on the first day of the month were the tops of the mountains seen, that corresponds and uniquely and certainly applicable to where we are today. On the first day of the new year, the 10th month on the Hebrew calendar here, it corresponds with our January. So he's saying on January the 1st, if we looked and put it into our calendar, were the tops of the mountains seen. So certainly as we start and venture out into this new year, I thought this would be an appropriate text of Scripture. I mean, can you imagine all this time with floods and problems and issues that they dealt with on the ark and all the things that have gone on with the world? Now we're seeing the hopes that the Lord's presenting to this next generation for this next period of time of anticipation, of joy, of hope, because now the tops of the mountains are being discovered and the flood is now declining. Certainly a sign that God has not forgotten 
to be gracious. The psalmist prayed that, Lord, do not forget to be gracious. No, I don't know if you've prayed that before. I, I certainly prayed that during the whole Harvey experience. <laughs> I don't know about you. Lord, be gracious unto us. The mountaintops, is there, they speak to us here today, even in this time, in this generation of the first day of the year. What will it bring? What do we expect? What do we think is going to happen? Is it going to be a year of joy? Or will it be sorrow? Will it be achievement, frustration, health, sickness? I mean, we have a lot to look forward to. But I want you to think of Noah in the ark as he looks out and he sees the, the, the vast expanse of water, but he sees these mountains begin to show around him. You can't see what lies beneath them, but these mountaintops, you know, they are seen. What's below the waterline is kind of like what's out there tomorrow for us. We can't quite see it. We, we don't know what the, what the veil, what's behind that veil. Will, will there be beautiful mountaintops, wonderful valleys, pleasant plains, or all the other things that, that might be seen? I do know as I look back over my shoulder, this last year was extremely challenging, not only for us as a church, but for many of you. It was a difficult year. You had, you had tr tr struggles with health. You had issues with finances. Some you had issues with losses in your family, loved ones. I mean, there's been a lot of complications. We can also look back and see a lot of joy. We, we experienced a lot of blessings. We've certainly seen in the midst of all the difficulties, the grace of God and the mercies of God. But there's a lot as we look forward. It's really kind of in total obscurity, all right? It's the old adage, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. Amen. And I praise God that he who holds tomorrow holds us and holds me. He holds you. So what, what, what's going to lie before us from this misty veil that's out there? These mountaintops are popping up. And I want to talk a little bit about those mountaintops today and what they might possibly represent to us. And I think obviously they speak of and represent the divine promises. Peter talked about the promises of God, calling them exceeding great. That's a pretty good de description. They're exceeding great promises. And not only are they exceeding great, they're precious promises. I believe God has spoken to Noah very clearly that judgment was going to come, but that there would be restoration. So as he looks at those mounds, you know that in him is an excitement. You know, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a joy that, I, I begin, that begins to explode in his heart about promise about hope. God has promised restoration. God has promised renewal. God has promised deliverance. And he's seen the obvious evidence of that. So these mountain peaks, as they begin to be revealed from the, and the water begins to recede, obviously it represents the promises of God. He has made promises to us. The word of God is filled with the promise of God. We as Christians, if we understand that passage in Second Peter, it says to us that we live our Christian life and we partake in our relationship and our fellowship with our Heavenly Father based upon these exceeding great and precious promises. In fact, the verse itself goes on to say, whereby these are the things that whereby we can participate in the very nature, the divine nature of God. What does that mean? That means this is how we have fellowship with God. God has made promises to us. We trust him and we trust his promises and we trust his word. God's making some promises, I believe, to us throughout Scripture that we should embrace. And if we're going to make any kind of resolution for this new year, if we're going to say, I resolve to do something, my resolution is this. I resolve to read, believe, pray, and stand on the promises of God this year more than any other time. I believe God's got some things, but it will not happen for those who won't read, pray, and believe those promises of God. This issue of my relationship with God requires me to follow, to trust, to believe. Jesus said, you know, come unto me. That requires action on my part. Jesus said, follow me. That requires action on my part. Jesus said, love me. That requires action on my part. Action to what? To his word and to these promises. Uh, not only the written things. I believe that God takes these written promises. For those of you who know how to walk with God, have learned how to be discerning, who are growing in Christ, you know what it means to be walking on the road of life and need God desperately for some of your life and then for God to speak one of these promises to your heart. And all of a sudden, that which is a written word becomes revealed in your heart and mind and you embrace that. You hold on to that. God told me that. I think often we get those moments where I got a word from God. 
then we have a tendency due to the floodwaters that surround us to say, oh, this doesn't look very, very encouraging, and not believe, and not trust God, and not hold. If God has given you a word for this new year, for your family, for your life, for your walk with Him, and the first thing you need to do is resolve, say, I will believe, I will trust, I will hold on to these precious promises. I am not going to let go. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I do know who holds it, and that's my God. So I'm making a firm commitment to God to believe Him for all He's saying to me and for all He's promised me. I'm going to trust Him. I'm going to believe Him. That's for our church. That's for your life. That's for your ministry. That's for your family. What has God spoken to you? You say, well, I don't think God's speaking to me much at all. Then I'd find out why, because God is speaking. Amen. God is speaking to his people. And if we're not reading his word and discerning it, understanding it, then we're not certainly not going to know what's been promised to us. Amen. So resolve in your own heart to rep, say, hey, I can see the mountaintops. I can't see what lies below the waterline, but I know that God is faithful, and I'm going to believe what he told me. Also, these, divine, these mountaintops not only speak to us the divine promises of God, I think they speak to us of spiritual possibilities. You say, what do you mean? I think many times when we relate to the promises of God, for the most part, we're thinking in more of a physical context, more than a spiritual context. Lord, I need healing. God, I need a need met in my life. God, I have a, a situation in my family. God, there's a deal with my job or there's an opportunity. And we're thinking about more in that line. But what we need to discover about the promises of God before those things, we also need to realize, and I think even more important than those things, are the possibilities about our spiritual life. In, in, in the Gospel of John, John's speaking and, and he's writing and he's, he's talking about the Lord Jesus and all that he is. And he says, to all who receive Jesus Christ... To them he gives the power to become the children of God. And I think one thing we need to realize as we move forward this year, claiming what God has for us, trusting what God has given to us, we need to realize that God is doing something in us. There's a spiritual work that is taking place, or at least should be taking place, where you're becoming more like Christ. God has given to you, through his promises, the power to become. There's a passage where Jesus is talking to, in the Gospels to, to Simon Peter, and he says, Thou art Peter, but thou shalt be. You know, you, you know, you're called Simon, but you shall be called uh, Peter. It's the same thing with us. We may and have been in our life before Christ one thing, but when I come to Christ, I am now something else. The Bible says if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. I am now this new person. I am now this new person who is inhabited by the Holy Spirit of God. I now can enjoy a spiritual life. I now have spiritual hope. I now have the ability to, because of this relationship, because of this newness, I have the capacity to read the Bible and understand it. I have the ability now to reach out in prayer and speak to God directly. I have the, the power to know what God desires in my life. And I think if we want to look for some, some glorious promises this year, it ought to be holding on to say, God's got a work he's doing in me, and I don't have to be frustrated because he's a big God, and he's given what needs to be given for me to be what he's called me to be. He's given me his word. He's given me his promises. I can be what God's called me to be. I don't have to be what I've been. You say, what do you mean? You've been acting like a jerk. You don't have to act like a jerk anymore. Somebody give me a hearty amen. Yeah. Uh, I can stand up for all the jerks, amen, all right? I can be a jerk. Don't you dare say amen. <laughs> Can't we? But now we have the power to become. Become what? Not a jerk. <laughs> become a man of God, to become that woman of God, to become that person who's filled with the presence of God's Spirit, who has the power now to act in love, to, act, to exercise forgiveness, to give grace, to show mercy. That's who we are. That's the possibility that's before us. We don't have to be what we used to be any longer. And if the mountaintops say anything, it's saying, hey, the old is gone, the new is here, and you're just seeing the portion of it is getting ready to be unfolded. My prayer today for each and every one of us is that we would experience such spiritual growth and, dis and, and, and maturity in our life this year that we're really walking in a new way with a new heart and a new mind and a new attitude of all the possibilities for us to be what God really wants us to be.
to really be that person of faith, to really be that person of compassion, to really be that person who cares about the lost, to really be that person who cares about other people in our fellowship even, that we have that kind of tenderness of heart, mind, soul, and spirit. That's the possibilities that we're talking about. That's the grace of God, the power to become. We have to run from that pathetic ideas and enchantment to say, well, you know, it could have been something or I should have been something or it might have been that. No. Now we're approaching this year with a whole new mindset a biblical mindset of the possibilities of God in our life which says, you know, that nothing's impossible to God and that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Away with the idea, well, I know, but I just don't think I can do that or I can't be that or I can't say that or I can't act that way or I just can't forgive or I just couldn't. Look. No, that's not you anymore. You're a different person. Now, if you're here without Christ, you're, you don't know Jesus, you're separated from God because of your, you've lived for yourself and not for Christ, then there's an understanding. You're bound in your old life. But when Christ comes, he breaks away the chains of the old self and of sin and of Satan and sets you free. So now you have this world of possibilities. I can do what God wants me to do. I can be a witness. I can be a lover. I can be a giver. I didn't think I could give. I can give. Isn't it amazing what God can do? If we look out before us, there should be some spiritual optimism about what God's going to do in us and with us in this year that comes. There's another mountaintop, I believe, that's represented here. We call it the mountaintop that represents our Christian privileges. You say, what do you mean by that? Our privileges. We have been given privilege. Now, one of the words that's used in Scripture is the word authority. But that's used in different places. Our power, we have the power to become. Literally, that what it says, the power to become. That's a word which means privilege. You now have the privilege. You have this delegated privilege from God. God has opened this door for you. You have Christian privileges. The greatest, and obviously, I think the, the obvious one is our, is, is our fellowship with the Father. We have fellowship with the Father. We have fellowship with the Son through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 1 John, he said, these words are written that you might know you have eternal life. What a privilege to know that I now know God. Has that gotten mundane? Has that gotten old hat? Has that wore out? You need to wake up, you know, and realize you have the privilege of knowing God. You have the privilege of God's Son by means and the operation of the Holy Spirit of God. He lives in you. What a privilege that your body is not just an empty vessel now. It is now holds and in it resides the presence of God. What a privilege. We who were once in darkness are now in light. What a privilege. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget what God has done. Don't forget what God is doing. That's a privilege. It's a blessing of God's grace. If your Christianity is mundane, if you're sitting here bored out of your mind, you just need to get plugged into Jesus. You need to discover this life that's in Christ, and you will never discover it looking to yourself or looking to this world to meet some kind of need that you think you have in your life. It will never be met. Amen. There's the privilege of what? There's this privilege, and we can go on with these privileges forever. Let's just put it like this, heavenly joy. Not like this world gives, Jesus said, but as I give. Heavenly peace, not like the world gives, but as Jesus gives. Heavenly guidance that the Holy Spirit has now committed to me to come alongside. He's called the paraclete in Scripture, the one who comes alongside. We also call him the comforter. In other words, he's there alongside you and with you throughout all of your days, throughout every situation, the ups, the downs, the in-betweens. You have the presence of God in your life, and with him he will bring you grace and peace and joy. That's a privilege you know the old song, you saying the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away? Well, let me tell you something. The world didn't give it to you <laughs> and the world can't take it away. And some of you perhaps are letting the world take it away. You're letting your joy be stolen by things in this world that are physical and temporal and not spiritual. But let me just add one more to this. I think we need to catch here. There's this, this, this mountaintop of Christian privileges, but with that comes opportunities. God has laid before you a host of opportunities this year. And you, you can't see them at all. The water hadn't come down to that level yet. <laughs> but as the water recedes, more and more is going to be revealed and more and more is going to be seen. And what you're going to discover, if you walk with God, 
you hold on to Jesus, you love him with all your heart, mind, and soul, you're committed to follow him, you're going to see the opportunity that God's going to give you. And probably going to see, if your eyes really get open, you say, you know, he's probably been here all the time. <laughs> and I just haven't seen them. You're going to see opportunities to make a difference in somebody's life. You're going to see opportunities to speak a word of encouragement. You're going to see opportunities to serve the Lord. You're going to see opportunities that make a difference in all of eternity, probably you hadn't seen before. These mountaintops, the more the water goes down, the more that we see and the more beautiful that they become. And so will the opportunities that God lies before you. But you're going to have to lift your head out of the, uh, out of the, of the sand and, and the fog the things that get clouding around us that hinder us from really seeing what's out there. You need to take a glimpse of what's before you. You have to forget the failures of last year or the failures of the past. And you, you, you learn from those things and you remember the lesson that you learned from those things and you remember how you learned to trust God from those things. But now we've, we've moved into a, the New Year's sun. Now we're in a, another place. Now God has some things that he wants to clearly reveal to you. Do not think for a moment. You're sitting here and you're 70 something hundred years old like I am, all right? I'm almost 70, it's just, but I'm, I'm a few years away from it. Don't dare think for a moment, well, I'm on Social Security now. I, I, you need to stay on Jesus Security. And you need to realize he's not done with you. I'll tell you one of the most exciting things to me is to see people up here all the time who've gotten into retirement years who are doing multiple things to serve the Lord around this fellowship. Blows my mind. You know, as Bill Stafford, the evangelist, say, you know, I'm not about to retire. I'm just going to refire. <laughs> I'm just going to refire. What opportunity? It doesn't matter where, if you're young, if you're old, anywhere in between. I just, I'm just so glad that the opportunities that God gives to us aren't dealt out by talent and skill abilities. He just blesses all of us. He'll take the blessing. They're not dealt out by personality, by charm or good looks. Lord, I'd never get to do anything. All right? But he gives them on the, on the basis of his grace and his mercy. And what has he laid before you? Don't be distracted from what the Lord really wants to do with your life this year. Don't settle for anything less because it will never satisfy your heart and your soul. We are new creations, and this is a new year, and we have new opportunities that we can trust the Lord for. So the goal is here, it's Christ more and self less. As John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. Let's keep that before us because we will see as we'll stay faithful to him, the opportunities will shine bright like the sun that, that are before us all throughout this year. Oh, one other thing I didn't put on the notes, I, and I, I obviously I, I don't know if I could forget this one because it's, it's, one, it's, it's probably the best of all these mountaintops, he representing the hope that we may soon experience of the Lord's return. I mean, it doesn't take much of a, of a watch on, on the news and then to read your Bible to see that these certainly last of the last, of the last, last days. <laughs> Amen. If, if Paul said these are the last days, we must be in the last of the last of the last days. I mean, never before have we seen so much prophetic events unfolding. I mean, since 1948 and to this present day, there's, there's probably never been a period like it except that period right before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. When so many things were unfolding and making ready for Christ's birth, you know, and now we're, we're seeing, I mean, literally kingdoms change. The world, it, it's, it, 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 it's, it's been radically touched by divine hand of God. Things that are going on around us are not happenstance. And then you see, as it was prophesied, Satan unfolding his plan, doing everything he can to frustrate, to defeat, and to thwart the plan of God. Man, Bible, if you have eyes to see, is coming alive before us now more than any other time in my life. And we ought to be holding out and understanding in the midst of all this darkness, the sunlight of Christ's return is about to spring open upon us. We're about to see the Lord's return. If, if the Lord delays, all right, and I do not see that in my lifetime, I do believe it will probably be in my children or grandchildren's lifetime. There's just not much more that needs to be done prophetically for longer delays. You hear that, Lord? <laughs> I remind him often this would be a good day for his return. Amen. It's on my bucket list, the rapture. Amen. <laughs> One thing I want to do before I die is the rapture. <laughs> He's coming back. And you can sit there in arrogance, and you can sit there in your fake intellectualism and scoff at that, but man, you're in for a surprise. <laughs> you're, it's going to blow your mind. When all of a sudden you wake up one day and 
The true church of Jesus Christ has vanished from off the planet and the world lies in absolute chaos. It's going to be a surprise to some of you Christians when the rapture does take place. You're going to look around and you're like, what we die? It's really happening. It's going to be a rupture instead of a rapture for some, as I've said before. Jesus is coming. Could be this year. That'd make it great, wouldn't it? Can I get a witness on that? <laughs> Could be this year. Hey, it'd be even better if it were today. Hallelujah. At least before the next car payment, right? <laughs> Leave my payments with the Antichrist. He can have it. That's the hope of the glory that we have. But let me wrap up with about three simple points that I want to make about this to note about these mountaintops. It's, it's important. Those mountaintops were seen from the ark. If you weren't in the ark, you didn't get to see the mountaintop. In fact, if you weren't in the ark, you were dead. You drowned. All right? But you're in the ark. And you can see those mountaintops from the ark. If you're not there, then there's no hope of seeing any promise or possibility. There's no reason for optimism on any level. Those radiant peaks beginning to stick out of that, that glossy, dirty water of the flood, those typify our Lord Jesus Christ who reigns in all his glory over all things and that we can trust him and that we can believe him. But we, we can look to him because we know him. We know that the ark represented salvation and deliverance from judgment that was falling upon the earth. It was an Old Testament type, an Old Testament symbol, typifying the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And if we're going to escape judgment that's to come, then we personally have to move into the ark ourselves. And Jesus is the doorway. He's opened it up and said, all who will come may come. Because there's another flood of wrath coming, all right? There's a flood of judgment, not water, but fire the next time. And we can run to the ark, and there we can find our safety. True spiritual vision for your life depends on the fact of you knowing Jesus Christ. If you have no personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you can't seem to peek into that spiritual realm. You won't be able to see the possibilities. You won't understand the Word of God. It won't make a lot of sense to you. You can go through every little dumbed-down version of translation you can find. It still won't make any sense to you. You'll catch that later. <laughs> it's only when you know Jesus Christ personally. And I would say the best way to start your year this year is get hooked up. Give your heart and your life to Jesus. Surrender your, your life to him. He's where hope and salvation. He will forgive every sin you've ever committed. He'll wash you clean. Your life will be new. Your eternity will be guaranteed. You'll have nothing to fear. You can laugh at death. You can walk through death like it was a smoke and step into the glorious presence of God. God's got great things for you, but it has to be from and in and by and through Jesus Christ. Do you know him? And if you do not, do not think that church life and religion and spirituality is going to change you at all. It's only a personal and vibrant and real commitment of your heart and life to Jesus Christ because of what he's done on the cross to pay the price for all your sin. He can forgive your sin and stands ready to receive you. But you've got to come to him and receive him. Another thing about these mountaintops, they were seen by Noah and his family from Ararat. The Bible says in this verse that the ark had come to rest on Ararat. That word means holy ground. Now, let me say this. That word holy is pretty much wholly forgotten. <laughs> W-H-O-L-E-Y. Our cultural Christianity, this Western Hemisphere mindset of, of Jesus, it certainly doesn't line up much today with Scripture. We're living in a world where anybody's a Christian, you know, everybody's a Christian, and it really doesn't even matter in the world today which you believe in Christ, you know, because we're all going to go to heaven, all paths lead the same place. What a hoax. Amen. And what a lie that Satan has sold. Yeah. You have to come to Jesus first, as I said. But then to see what God is doing and how God is working, you have to, you're not going to see it from any old place. It's seen from a position of living your life on holy ground. You say, what in the world do you mean? That's a life of commitment. Jesus in Scripture and the apostles all throughout Scriptures remind us that God is holy. But also says, God says, be ye holy even as I am holy. Now, we've talked about this word holy, but let me just reiterate again what it means. We've used, if you read your Bible and your commentaries sometimes, it says it means to be set apart. All right? To be set apart. Now, Understand when it says to be set apart, it's not like saying, well, here's a glass of water, here's a glass of water, all right? So they're kind of apart from each other. 
Those are two glasses of water. When it means to be set apart, it means you're set apart to something that's not like anything else. In fact, the word could literally be translated in the Hebrew, other than. It's not like anything else. We use the word in the English, unique. It's nothing like it. It's unique. There's nothing like it. Some of you think you're pretty unique. There's a thousand million people like you, <laughs> like me. You know, I may be weird, but there's a bunch of other weirdos. All right? It's unique. It's different. But this is different, 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 different. This is other than. This is so unique, there's nothing like it. And there's no way you can get like that without him. He says, I'm holy. So when you come to him, he makes you holy, but now you live a life that is holy. Your life, what does that mean? It means I'm committed to Christ. It means I'm really a disciple of Jesus Christ. It means I'm, it's more than a church member. I'm serious about my walk with God. I'm serious about my talk. I'm serious about my life and my behavior, the way I treat my wife, the way I respond to my children, the way I, the way I lead the church, the way I do your job, the way, you, the way you treat your money. All that changes now because now I'm unique. I, I belong to Christ. I, I'm with him. I'm, I'm living with him and walking in him. And now because I'm in him and I'm, I'm living this whole life, I can see. I have good spiritual perception. I'm not nearsighted spiritually. I'm not farsighted spiritually. I can see clearly now, all right? I can see clearly. The clouds are gone. The sun is shining. Obviously, I'm getting now word from God. But hey, you can't live a holy life without some changes in your life. Now, I've understood that people who call me, and I, you know, they'll, they'll call me words like, well, Joe, you're just a legalist. Now, first of all, the people who say that, they think they're being theological. They have no idea what the word means. Biblically, a legalist is someone who thinks they can follow the rules of Scripture, the law of God, and that's going to save them. All right? That's legalism. I don't believe that at all. I believe you've got to trust Jesus for your salvation. Amen? Amen? that there's no other name under heaven given among men where they might, whereby they must be saved. I believe you must repent and believe. I believe what the Bible teaches, it's a life of faith in Christ. All right? So, but they think, but well, you, you don't do this and you don't do that and you don't do this. You know, you don't smoke and you don't drink and you don't cuss and you don't do this. So, you know, you're just a legalist. I'm under grace is what they like to say. And you better be glad you are. You'd be dead already. <laughs> which means I'm under grace, you know, I can do what I want to do. Now, if you understand grace properly, yeah, you can. But the deal is with grace is you won't want to if you're under grace. The Bible says the grace of God teaches us that we deny all ungodliness and live righteous lives. What the Bible says is what grace is. So if I'm under grace, I'm denying anything that's ungodly, anything that's going to interfere with the Holy Spirit's work in my life, anything that's going to interrupt what God wants to do. In other words, I can't say I'm a holy individual and be over here watching pornography. I'm not holy, am I? I polluted my mind. The Bible says I'm supposed to love God with all my mind. So how can I be holy with a dirty mind? Will I be tempted? Yeah, I'll be tempted. But do I respond to it? Not if I'm going to be holy. I'll make some choices. So, I mean, you can just go down everything. It, 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 let's get more practical for some of you because you don't drink. You don't have to lie. You don't have to cheat. You don't have to be a, someone who won't forgive other people. That's not holy. If you're not a forgiver, you're not holy. If you're not a lover, you're not holy. If you're not kind, you're not holy. If you're not patient, you're not holy. And that hurts a little bit more, doesn't it? Y'all rather go back to the drinking part, right? <laughs> pornography. Let's deal with that. <laughs> get, them, get them folks on pornography a little more. If I want to see the possibilities that God has for my life this year or any time, it's going to be from a holy perspective. I want to, I'm going to be seeing it from an air But along with that, they're on a mountain that's a little higher from the other mountains. They're up there for days before the other mountaintops are seen. So what I'm saying, they're seen, those mountaintops are seen from another mountaintop. If you're below that, you can't see anything, you're drowned, right? <laughs> we, we are elevated. Please understand, as a Christian, we don't get arrogant about it, all right? We're not haughty. In fact, it brings humility to us. But the Bible says we're seated in heavenly places. We're, 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 we're seated with Christ. We're in him. That's an elevated position. That's a place of, of, of grace. That's a place of anointing. That's a place of victory. That's a place of power. I don't have to listen to what the devil tells me to do. I can tell the devil, leave me alone, he has to. All right? It's elevated. 
And if we're going to see what really lies before us, we can't be having this little puny mindset and unbelieving attitude, you know. We, 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 have to, we have to step out onto the mountaintop and see what's out there. You can't live your life hiding in the ark, all right? There's some folks down in the ark still and they're saved and they're clinging to the ribs of the ship while the floods are going on. They're saying, I hope this place is safe. I hope the ship doesn't fall apart. And the waves are rolling, the ship's rolling, they're holding on for dear life. I hope this thing lasts. Listen, Jesus lasts. Your, your salvation is firm. The Bible says when you put your faith in Jesus Christ and you plant your life on his word, that yes, the floods will come. The rains are going to happen, the storms and winds are going to blow, and the floods are going to rise, but hey, you don't have to worry. You're planted. You're in the rock. You're on the rock. You're part of the rock. The rock is in you. You're in the rock as well as on the rock. You're a new person. So when all that's happening, hey, don't be afraid to come out of the ark. Now, I'm not talking about out of your salvation. I'm talking about out of your hiding place. There's a lot of people who hide in church every Sunday. And they come in here and they worship and they enjoy and they say amen and they give their money. But when they go out, man, you know, it, it, it's, there's nothing comes out of their life in a public world. Where God puts us out in this world, understand, we're on display now. God said, I'm going to show the world what it's like to be about like somebody like who's saved, who knows Christ. But yet, instead of that, we're still hiding out in the yard. Hey, there comes a time when you've got to let go of the interior of the ship and get your behind out the door and shine and speak and stand the way God's called you to do it. Amen. Now, I know that didn't get as many amens as it should. It might have been an oh me. <laughs> but nonetheless, what are you doing hiding? What are you doing cowering in the shadows? Don't you really believe what God says? Don't you really believe that he's given you the power to become a child of God? Don't you really believe that all things will work together in your life for good? Don't you really believe that he's called you to be the witness to the world? I mean, these are all the things that are clear instructions for us. And with every one of those instructions are great promises of his fellowship with you. I'll be with you when you go. I will speak through you when you speak. All those promises are valid and real today so that whatever I do out there in the public venue, God's with me, God's on me, God's through me. Man, that's, a, that's the blessing of God in our life. You can't come in here and be one thing out there any more than you come in here and go home. Mistreat your family. Be arrogant, be cruel, be unfaithful. Be, be spiteful. I, I listened in on Tim's sermon, so he dealt with that a lot last week, so I'll leave that alone. <laughs> Amen. But what happens? We have to move out to the world where God has called us to live and, and realize this is a, this is a suspense-filled world in a, in a good way. We've climbed into the ark and we've found deliverance and salvation. Now we get to go out and share the message with the rest of the world that there's, there's deliverance and there's salvation. Living a life of believing or a life of fear, what's it going to be? I choose the other. I choose the believing ground. I think that God's given us opportunities that should blow our mind. It's a time. The first day of the 10th month, January 1st, he says, I saw the mountaintops. I pray that in your life you can see the mountaintops. I pray you're not focused on the floodwaters of the past. That debris is swept away. God's doing something unique and special this time, this year, this day in your life. What would hinder you from just pulling all the stops? Say, Lord, I am tired of playing partway with you, and I'm tired of going just halfway and almost all the way. I just given up to you. Amen. Consecrate and committing my life to you and to this season of my life that you have me in, young, old, or in between, to be what you want me to be. I'm ready for the journey. I'm ready for the adventure. Climb on board. Let's see what God will do. Peaks are just the top part. There's more to come. Daily, more is revealed. If we're watching, if we're faithful, and if we're ready. Are you ready? Let's stand with our heads bowed. This morning, I'd ask you just to open your heart, your mind, your spirit to the Lord God. I believe with all my heart, with all the prayer and preparation that goes into a message, with all, I, I believe with all my heart that God has been speaking, speaking, and everyone has had the opportunity to hear. My prayer today is that you have heard what the Spirit of God has said to you. My first encouragement is to you that are believers. I would encourage you, if God has spoken to your heart today, to start this year at this altar, just to come and find a place, renew your heart, your mind, your soul with the Lord, just between you and your Heavenly Father. 
just to make sure that the, 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 the way is prepared with a clean heart and that you're going to live your life from that holy place. Where you're going to live that, your life from your commitment to Christ and get it, get, it, get it ready, prepared. Ask God to fill you afresh and anew with his Holy Spirit, to stir in your mind again his will and his word and his promises, to open your eyes. So this altar, even right now, if you want to come forward, make your way here to this altar and find a place to commit to the Lord, I'd encourage you to do that. Don't wait for anybody else. And as they come, if you're here without Jesus Christ, my prayer to you is to, is to say, come to Jesus today. Come to any one of these men here in the front, including myself. Give your heart and life to Christ. Say, tell, take one of these brothers by and say, listen, today I'm surrendering my life to Jesus. Pray for me as I start this life. Pray for me as I commit to Christ. Pray for me as I choose to live for him as my Lord and Savior today.